Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Climate Jobs and Justice Public Forum on the Future of West Virginia. We are so glad that you could join us tonight to hear about localized information on climate impacts and solutions and how you can get involved. We had nearly 300 people register for tonight's forum and everyone should be able to use the chat function throughout the program to ask questions and share resources. To start with, we would like to invite everybody to introduce yourself in the chat. Tell us where you're joining from so we can get a sense of who is in this virtual room together. I'm Angie Rosser, I'm your moderator for tonight's forum. And I serve as the executive director of the West Virginia Rivers Coalition. And West Virginia Rivers is one of the founding members of the West Virginia Climate Alliance, who is the host and organizer for tonight's event. To introduce you to the West Virginia Climate Alliance, we have a short video to share. So Quentin, can you please roll the video? The West Virginia Climate Alliance is a coalition of almost 20 environmental, faith-based, civil rights, and civic organizations with a focus on climate change. We work together to offer science-based education on climate change to West Virginia citizens and policymakers. We focus our efforts at climate solutions on three main pillars of reform. The first pillar is climate justice for communities that have borne the brunt of the fossil fuel economy. The second pillar is a true transition for coal miners and other fossil fuel workers likely to be impacted by the transition to a low carbon economy. The third pillar is a significant reduction in greenhouse gases in accordance with the findings of the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Join us for the most important and essential work of these times. All right, well, we thank you 
for that introduction. That was a video put together by Douglas and Brogno, who provides communication support to the West Virginia Climate Alliance. And I love to see everyone chatting in where they're joining from. Looks like we've got great representation from all over the state. Good to be together. And for the, the West Virginia Climate Alliance, we, we saw the need to put together this forum, recognizing that we're at a pivotal time, a, a defining moment for our climate future and for the future of West Virginia. Uh, a couple weeks ago, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the United Nations body for assessing the science related to climate change, issued a new report. It confirms that impacts of climate change are now widespread and severe from drought and wildfires to extreme storms. And that here in West Virginia, we can expect more heat waves and more intense rainfall and flooding. That's the bad news. But the good news from that report is that it points out that it's not too late to make a substantial difference for our future. If we act now, we can avoid the worst impacts of climate change. And we're also aware, um, as probably many of you are, that Congress is currently considering policies and investment to ad address climate change in their infrastructure and budget reconciliation measures. So this is a momentous opportunity to get involved in shaping our future. And we know that West Virginia is in a unique position and has a lot at stake as this nation transitions to clean energy sources. Of course, we also have Senator Manchin positioned to lead on climate as chairman of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. And we're so glad that we have so many West Virginians here to learn more uh, from an esteemed panel of speakers tonight. Uh, we'll be hearing about how we can support West Virginia's most vulnerable communities affected by the climate crisis, how we support coal workers and coal communities in our state, and how we create jobs and improve the health of our residents. We'll have each of our speakers give a brief presentation, and then we'll have uh, the panelists field your questions. So we encourage you as we move through the program to use the chat function or the Q&A um, to post your questions, and we'll get to them at the Q&A segment after the conclusion of all the presentations. Now to introduce our first speaker, we have Pam Nixon with the West Virginia NAACP, who will share with us through an environmental justice lens how we need to be thoughtful about climate impacts and solutions and how they play out in West Virginia's most vulnerable communities. While Pam is loading her slides, there you go, Pam, looks good. Um, I've had the honor of know, working with Pam through the years. Um, she is a well-known leader on environmental justice in, in West Virginia. She earned her bachelor's degree from West Virginia State University and her master's in environmental science from West Virginia College of Graduate Studies, now the Marshall University Graduate School. Pam has over 20 years of experience as a laboratory medical technologist, and I first got to know her as uh, the environmental advocate of, for the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection, where she served in that role for 15 years. And she remains very active in environmental and social justice issues in our state, and now leads the Environment and Climate Justice Committee of the West Virginia NAACP. So thanks for being with us, Pam, tonight. We're, we're ready to hear from you. Thank you, Angie. Okay. Uh, the year 2020 and the year 2016 were the warmest years on record for the entire world, according to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Climate change is affecting all of us. Both, but the low income communities and communities of color are bearing the worst of the consequences, and many are now struggling to pay high energy bills. During heat waves, they experienced higher heat related illnesses and death. The US EPA has documented that since 1901, the global surface temperature has risen 0 0.17 degrees Fahrenheit per decade which is an increase of about two degrees over the past 120 years. Well, this doesn't sound like much, but uh, the earth systems are so interconnected so that the slightest temperature increase 
could affect one or two systems and they could begin to fail. And the rest can fall like dominoes, leading to more frequent extreme droughts, hurricanes, flooding, and wildfires. Many disenfranchised communities are composed of people of color, the low income, immigrants, elderly, youth, disabled, and the LGBTQ+. And often they are located in low-lying areas, leaving them at risk of property damage from extreme flooding. These marginal communities are called front line, fence line, or environmental justice communities. Many here in West Virginia are already vulnerable due to the nutritious food scarcity, limited access to health care, limited affordable safe housing, and they are already being exposed to poor air quality and water quality. Our extracted fossil fuel resources and manufacturing industries provides jobs and feed our, to feed our families and to educate our families also, but they also, so, also pose health risks for the workers in nearby communities. These health risks can be anything from cancers to cardiopulmonary disease to asthma, COPD, black lung, and et cetera. Now cities and towns in West Virginia and elsewhere are working are working to, um, to be more climate resilient. Frontline communities have fewer resources to both prevent and recover from climate disasters. And they're likely to get, and they're less likely, sorry about that, they're less likely to get federal aid after a disaster. When housing and infrastructure are more resilient, to, are made more resilient to change, the cost can render them out of range for those that they were meant to help. The, the solution is for the political will for our elected officials to actually have the political will to make policy changes that will actually help vulnerable communities to, to dramatically reduce industrial toxic emissions and greenhouse gases from the source to advance energy efficiency and the use of clean renewable energy and to strengthen community resilience and livability. In the past, community members have been included in the talks, but when it came to the decisions, they were actually told what was gonna take place. To bring about justice, frontline communities need technical assistance to be equal participants in identifying the risks and finding solutions. Each community is unique. So developers need to share the best practice models from across the region in order to expand resilient, affordable housing options. Funding is needed to support the pre-disaster actions to reduce the impacts of climate change. Stronger infrastructure is needed to ensure that a reliable grid will deliver dependable wastewater treatment, potable water, and energy for the residents. This will take a multitude of multiple stakeholders, along with the frontline communities and their leaders as full partners in both the planning stage and the decision-making stage. So who are the key players? They're community organizations, county and city and community development agencies. And remember in West Virginia, many of our struggling communities are unincorporated and don't have the, uh, the support of being a municipality. We should have also nonprofits and legal resources to aid local efforts to support resilient, affordable housing. There will be the need for grants and trustworthy financial institutions and nonprofit development developers. Residential and tenant uh, association programs will also be needed to support the tenants should they want to per should they want to purchase uh, a residence and to promote the improvements that can be made to already existing buildings. And when training occurs, 
for the fossil fuel impacted uh, workers so as not to leave them behind so that they can make a just transition. We should also include the, the BIPOC communities. And in case you're not sure what a BIPOC community is, it's Black or African Americans, Indigenous people, and people of color. Many of these communities were left behind from the very beginning as the result of historic systemic barriers. Include us in the training for the manufacturing, installation, maintenance, and other technical skill sets in the clean energy fields. And if you include us in, then we will have a just transition. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Thank you for that important message and, and essential recommendations that need to be included in, in how we think about our approach to, to climate. One of the, the early commitments we made as a West Virginia Climate Alliance was to put front and center environmental and climate justice and make sure that those communities that are, are most affected, bear most of the brunt of environmental and climate harms are at the center, uh, as Pam pointed out, of of uh, discussions and decision-making and solutions. So thank you for that, Pam. And another uh, priority, and you heard in the introduction, was a fair and equitable, uh, if you will, a true transition for fossil fuel workers and communities. And we're fortunate to have with us tonight, Jeremy Richardson as our next speaker to provide practical guidance on how we can support coal workers and communities in a changing energy landscape. Jeremy Richardson is a senior energy analyst for the Climate and Energy Program with the Union of Concerned Scientists. And proud to say he's a West Virginia native. He hails from a third generation coal mining family in West Virginia. And with, with more than 10 years of experience in climate and energy issues, Dr. Richardson focuses on federal climate and energy policy development, specializing in the economics of, of, of energy. There we go. Economics of energy, particularly coal and nuclear power, and writes and speaks passionately about the need for a just transition for the coal fields, which you're about to hear. Take it away, Jeremy. Well, thanks very much, Angie, and thanks for having me. It's, it's a pleasure to see so many familiar faces and uh, so many familiar names uh, flying through the chat there. So I'm just delighted to be here. Uh, as Angie mentioned, I, I do come from West Virginia, just outside of Fairmont and uh, from a third generation coal mining family. My brother still works in the mines today. And that has always been the lens uh, through which I've seen the climate issue. Uh, so thanks, uh, Pam, for your, uh, for your comments and your presentation. Um, you really named um, the climate, um, the, cl the issues we're facing around climate impacts. I'll just note, I'm, I'm not going to talk about climate change um, in my presentation, but I'll just note that the Union of Concerned Scientists has done a tremendous uh, amount of research on the impacts of climate change and have a ton of resources on our website. Um, a lot of reports that we've done that have very specific geographical information about, about extreme heat, uh, for example, a lot of stuff on sea level rise and storm surge uh, as well. But it's a lot of it's broken down by, by county, by congressional district. So if you want to learn more, I can point you in the right direction. You can poke around on our website. I wanted to take a few minutes and, and I'll, I'll be brief because I, I'd love to get to your questions, but I'd just like to talk a little bit about <clears throat> a report that I wrote with the Utility Workers Union of America it was published a few months ago and, um, and really uh, digs into some details about how, uh, you know, what a fair transition or a just transition or a true transition looks like for people who are dependent on the fossil fuel industry and specifically the coal industry for their economic livelihoods. Um, this is gonna be one piece of the puzzle, uh, really looking at supports for the actual workers, but it's worth noting, and we discuss at length in our report, um, the resources that are gonna be needed for uh, communities as well. Um, for example, uh, filling the gaps in tax revenue uh, following the closure of a facility, uh, making sure that the 
mines and the or, and the coal ash ponds are cleaned up so that you know communities have a uh, a good chance at at uh, drawing new industries, building new businesses. But what I'm going to talk about today is really focused on the the worker piece of it. Um, so I just got a couple slides here. This first slide shows um, the 462 counties uh, that we identified as coal counties in our report. Um, what we did was we looked at um, information data from 2015 and 2019 uh, that looked at uh, you know, where there was coal mining, where there were coal mining jobs and where there were coal fired power plants located. So it's at two points in time. Um, that's how we, we defined what a coal county is. Um, the, um, the way that we tried to evaluate how dependent a county was on the, on the coal industry was a list of 10 uh, risk criteria. And you can look into the report for the details of that, but they were sort of roughly around, uh, in the past, did it, have, um, uh, did it have a loss in coal mining jobs? over that period of 2015 to 19? Uh, did it see a decline in, in coal production of at least 10%? Um, you know, were there currently, as of 2019, at least 50 people employed in the county in coal mining? Very similar for the coal-fired power plants. So the, for those counties, um, was there the retirement of a, of a significant uh, capacity in coal-fired generating capacity, so at least 100 megawatts? Um, similar for jobs. And then also, is there a known uh, uh, coal plant retirement coming uh, before 2030? Um, and then we did add some economic indicators in there as well around unemployment and uh, poverty and uh, poverty rates and so forth. Um, and so what you're looking at here is the is you know, which ones pop out on the map. So, so of the there of the 10 indicators, there was one county. Um, Navajo County, Arizona, that hit nine of the 10 um, criteria. And so a couple of things pop out at you that aren't terribly surprising. Uh, Central Appalachia has a lot of coal counties and they tend to be a, a little, uh, have higher risk factors. Um, and you see the Southwest, as I mentioned, particularly Arizona, New Mexico. Um, and then you see counties pop out in, in the Power River Basin and, and in um, and in Montana, where there's a big coal plant. Um, let me just pop to the next one. So what our report was, and by the way, I just want to give a shout out to the West Virginia um, Citizens Climate Lobby, who did some of the brown, groundbreaking work on, on trying to understand and, and calculate what the cost of, of supporting dislocated coal workers would be. Um, what I think is significant about what we've done here is that it's really the first time that I know of that a national environmental group and a labor union have uh, sort of gotten together and collaborated on, uh, you know, saying both things, what I call both things, that we have to address um, climate change, it's an urgent crisis, and we also have to figure out how to take care of the people that are going to, that are going to you know, suffer the consequences of that transition. And, and it's, it's, it's the fair thing to do. Um, and it's a critical piece of the puzzle that we can't ignore. Uh, so what we've done here is we've uh, articulated a set of, um, of, of supports, if you will, or resources that uh, we think are critical to making sure that the workers who are um, gonna lose their jobs in the energy transition, you know, have a fighting chance to be part of the new economy, have a chance to reinvent themselves. And so one of the big one here is this uh, piece around um, five years of comprehensive wave, wage replacement for the workers, um, you know, facing uh, the closure of a mine or a plant. And that's by far the biggest um, piece of the puzzle in terms of costs. And, and we've, um, what we've done here is, is framed it as a range. And I would like to take a second to explain why that is. First of all, it's it's because all of these, as you'll see in a second, all of these numbers are built upon reasonable assumptions, uh, but you can make different assumptions and get different numbers. But the, the big thing for us was as an environmental organization, you know, and, and concerned about climate, we really need coal to phase out of the system as quickly as possible. 
uh, so by 2030. And if you look at any model of the electricity system that assumes a price on carbon will, will show coal out of the system by 2030. Um, if you do that, more people need support, more workers need support because fewer of them will reach age, age 65 over that time period. Um, but if you're representing those workers as a as a union leader, you want to you want to give people more time to adjust to the change. And so we assume 2040 on the low end. It's called the low end because the costs are lower because, again, uh, more of those people would then age out of the system um, by the time uh, over the life of the program. <clears throat> so at any rate, uh, we talk about the five years of wage replacement. And, and that really, this, this sort of length of the benefits is really critical because if uh, what we find happening in the economy is that um, people will, workers will uh, take the quickest path that they can find to get a new job because they need to support their families, understandably. Um, and what that often, uh, oftentimes what that is, is uh, getting a commercial driver's license. Now that might be a fine career path for, for many folks. I'm not being disparaging, but the point is that uh, people should have enough time to evaluate their situations, figure out if they wanna go back to school, decide if they wanna pursue a different opportunity, have the space to think through those options and, and be deliberate. And so when we say education benefits on the second line, we really intend those to be uh, flexible. So if you want to go to community college, if you want to go to a vocational school, if you want to get a certification, if you want to go to a four-year university, you ought to be able to do that. And the next one is uh, really estimating the cost of extending that benefit to family members as a way of, of helping to get out of these cycles of generational poverty. These, these jobs are the, among the, the highest paying um, jobs, you know, um, uh, in the economy that are still blue collar jobs. And a lot of workers see that as, you know, giving something to their kids so that they can, um, you know, do more. And, and so that's what, th that's what this line is intended to uh, um, get at. And then some of these other pieces, the job placement services, these are uh, federal programs that can be plussed up and uh, the relocation assistance is, you know, only as a last resort do we want people to, um, consider leaving their communities because every family that leaves leaves the community um, that much more hollowed out. Um, I think I will talk about these assumptions in detail because I, I, I always lose track of time when I'm talking, but I feel like I've talked too long. Um, but just to say one thing, the, the low case 2040 uh, coal phase out, the lifetime of the program is 25 years because you would assume that those benefits continue for five years beyond the time the, the last worker was uh, laid off. And similarly for the high case, 20, 30, 15 years. Again, what I was just saying earlier about the, you know, a lot of these are just assumptions. Um, how many people will actually avail themselves of the educational benefits? Well, your guess is as good as mine. Um, those are the assumptions that we made. Um, and uh, maybe I'll just stop there and say, I, I'm looking forward to your questions. I'd be happy to, to chat with you on email or, or however else you'd like to get in touch and, uh, and uh, continue the conversation. I'm, I'm really um, passionately believe that, that if we're gonna solve the climate crisis, we have to solve um, this crisis as well. Thanks. Indeed, indeed. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, that was a good reminder for folks. If you have questions for Jeremy, Pam, any of the panelists, just put those in the chat as they come to mind and we'll log those and come back to them um, after the presentation. Our, our next presentation we, is by Sean O'Leary. Sean is the senior researcher with the Ohio River Valley Institute and is a native of Wheeling, West Virginia, my old stomping grounds and has written about coal, natural gas, and their role in economies of Appalachia in a book, a newspaper column, and a blog titled The State of My State. And Sean is gonna extend our discussion now on how West Virginia can effectively set itself up for employment growth 
we're talking jobs, jobs, jobs as we transition from fossil fuel dependence. So, Sean, over to you. Well, thank you so much, Angie, and thank you all for the opportunity um, to address these issues tonight because I really am optimistic about the opportunities that West Virginia has, um, both as a function of where the economy is going right now, and also some of the uh, legislation that's coming out of Washington. Um, but what has been happening recently, some of you may know that um, over the past year during which the Ohio River Valley Institute has been in existence, We've done a series of reports that have basically analyzed uh, particularly the natural gas industry and also the petrochemical industries, which many of our legislators have been holding out as the hopes for economic revival in the region. And sadly, that is a misplaced hope. Um, you know, for those of you who are from the greater Ohio Valley and or are familiar with Western Pennsylvania or Southeastern Ohio, where the natural gas boom in Appalachia has taken place, you know that while production has skyrocketed, there's been very little in the way of corresponding growth in jobs or prosperity. And so one of the questions that I have been going around to county commissions and economic development authorities and asking them is, what would you, you know, what would you expect? What have you expected? And do you think you're getting a good deal from the natural gas boom and the other promises that have been made in the region? And the answer is almost always, no, we're not getting a good deal. It's not working. And all you have to do is go through downtown Bolero, Ohio, or Wheeling, West Virginia, or Waynesburg, Pennsylvania to, to see that that's a case. But at the same time, I get a question thrown back at me. And that question is, what's the alternative? And I am very optimistic because I feel like now for the first time in a very long time, we have a pretty good answer to that question. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about why. And so one of the slides that I've been sharing with a lot of county commissions is the one you should be able to see now. In which, case, in which the question at the top is, which county's employment growth would you rather have? And in 2014, the slide depicts a chart for six counties that had experienced negative employment growth over the previous 16 years, going back to 1998. Four of those counties, uh, the ones in red plus Belmont County in Ohio, became natural gas producing counties during the fracking boom. Also, one of the counties listed is Beaver County, Pennsylvania, where the Shell ethane cracker plant is being built right now. And you can see that all of those counties saw flat and or negative job growth um, for an extended period. In fact, there never was a spike in jobs in those counties. But there is one county that stands out. It's Lewis County, Washington. Um, in dark blue, which didn't host a major natural gas or petrochemical expansion or any other major chemical expansion, but it alone saw significant employment growth. And that's why, by the way, going back to the map that Jeremy just shared a few minutes ago, if you look in Washington state, you'll see that there's just one county uh, highlighted as a coal county. That is Lewis County, Washington you'll also see that it is one of the whitest counties, um, meaning the color on his map, which means it's one of the least economically distressed. What I'm about to describe for you is why. First, you have to understand that in the natural gas boom, between 2008 and 2019, Counties in Ohio, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania saw a huge explosion in economic output as measured by GDP. And a lot of times we'll hear the governor and various legislators talk about it. And we've even heard the head of West WVU's business school talk about an economic miracle taking place. Well, it was if you were in the natural gas industry, but when you look at the measures of economic prosperity that we usually expect to accompany economic growth, none of them happened. 
the region is highlighted in yellow in this chart showed a below average increase in personal income, almost no increase in jobs, and a loss, a net loss of population throughout the, end, throughout the region. And so one of the questions was, how could all that money that was invested, and it is a lot of money, literally over $200 billion in the region, how could that much money be invested in a region and not produce job growth? Well, there are a series of reasons, and they're very disturbing reasons. I won't go through all of them here, but what I can tell you is that the reasons are structural, which means regardless of how much the petrochemical industry or the natural gas industry grows, it will continue the trend that it has exhibited over the past decade, which is economic growth without incre corresponding increases in jobs and prosperity. And that's partly because these industries are among the least labor intensive in the US economy. Of the jobs that are created, many go to out of state workers and all but a tiny fraction of the revenue that they generate migrates to management and investors who live outside of the region. In other words, it is the very definition of the resource curse. What's good news is that we have an alternative to that kind of economic growth as represented by Lewis County, Washington, or the Centralia Micropolitan Statistical Area. Centralia is an old coal town of 18,000, and it's the hub of a micropolitan area of 80,000. In 2006, Centralia lost its largest employer, a coal mine that employed 600 workers. Then it learned that by 2025, it would lose another major, major employer, a coal-fired power plant that once employed 370 people. And that's a scenario that a lot of you have heard. Those of you who may live in Marshall, Ohio, and Wetzel counties are actually going through exactly this scenario right now with respect to the Mitchell coal-fired power plant there. The difference is that in Centralia, beginning in 2016, distribution of $55 million in economic transition funding began. And it happened through a weatherization fund that supports economic efficiency upgrades for low and moderate income residents, an economic and community development fund that targets workers, families, and businesses, and also an energy technology fund that funds the development of clean energy in the region. And something remarkable happened as a result of that. Between 2015 and 2019, GDP in Centralia grew at twice the rate of the nation's GDP. And after trailing the nation in job creation for more than a decade, Centralia's job growth was nearly twice that of the nation. This community that has about the same population as Ohio, Marshall, and Wetzel counties in West Virginia put together added 2,800 jobs. And also the population wages grow, grew 50% faster than the national average and Centralia's population grew faster as well. And there are a variety of reasons that all of these outcomes happened, but most of them circle around the fact that energy efficiency in the education sectors in which grant funding is highly concentrated are highly labor intensive. Work in these sectors is performed by local workers and contractors, and so much of the upstream and downstream activity that occurs subsequently is local as well. The grants leverage existing businesses and programs. They stimulate added investment from homeowners and business owners, which compounds by three to four times their impact. And also, and importantly, the grants are annuity producing because increased energy efficiency reduces utility bills, it puts more disposable income in the pockets of residents, and it continues to do so for years and decades. And finally, the model is these jobs are shovel ready. When we talk about energy efficiency in education, you can start spending tomorrow and the benefits begin almost immediately. But what's most, most exciting for me is that the strategy that was employed in Centralia and produced these results are eminently replicable in Appalachia. And so 
my hope is that we'll look at the Centralia model, recognize that it can be replicated in economically distressed companies in West Virginia and throughout America, and also recognize that we're now in a phase where sources of funding are coming online from the federal government and other locations. And I hope to be able to talk with many of you in the future about how your local counties and communities might be able to take this model and apply it locally to generate true bottom-up growth um, that is sustainable and that allows West Virginia to ride the wave of clean energy transition rather than trying to fight it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. A lot of food for thought there. And I think what, what Pam, Jeremy, and Sean all brought together that climate change is uh, as much of a, a people issue as it is an environmental issue. And another human dimension of climate change is health. And, and one way climate change becomes very personal for all of us is the effects on our own health, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual. And tonight, we're fortunate to have Dr. Kate Waldeck to provide her expertise and direct experience of, the clim of climate change's impact on the health of West Virginia children. Dr. Waldock is a pediatric critical care physician at Hoops Family Children's Hospital in Huntington, West Virginia, and is an assistant prof professor at Marshall University School of Medicine. She was born and raised in West Virginia and then went to, uh, to attend Yale University for her undergrad, went on to the State University of New York in Brooklyn for medical school, her pediatric residency was at Kaiser Oakland. You've been, you've been around, Kate. Yeah. <laughs> We're glad you found your way back, though. We certainly are because, uh, you know, what she says she is passionate, and you're going to hear that, I think, in a moment about mitigating climate change because she sees firsthand how it affects her patients and even her own family. So over to you, Dr. Waldeck. Thanks for being here. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I'm uh, always uh, wanting to spread the message about the changes in the health of our children that we can see happening in real time right in front of us. Um, I also want to mention briefly that my cat learned how to open doors. So apologies if he decides to visit. Um, so I'm going to be presenting on the effects of climate change on the health of children, but just want to also state briefly that much of this also will apply to the adult population. I'm just speaking to um, my knowledge personally. All right, so this is just a very brief overview. There are a couple different components to air pollutants that uh, have significant health effects. So one is ozone, which is a direct irritant to the lungs. And then the others um, significant that entity that I'm going to talk about today are particles, uh, which are uh, released from burning fossil fuels. And they're very, very small. So we probably know a little more about this now because of COVID, but basically they are so small that they're very easily carried deep down into the lungs. Uh, and when this happens, they cause significant irritation and direct inflammation. Um, in adults, we actually can tie this, uh, some of this, this uh, process to worsening heart disease. Um, and in children, we see a significant impact on the rates and severity of asthma. Uh, this is pictures worth a thousand words. So this is just a picture of a healthy airway um, and then uh, an inflamed uh, and spasmed airway like we see in children with asthma. So um, I think it's important for our, um, to mention that children are actually more vulnerable to the effects of climate change for several reasons. They have something called a higher minute ventilation. So basically they breathe faster. So they take more of the air into their body uh, than an adult does when you think about the size of their body relative to how much they breathe. They also eat and drink per pound. And I won't be talking about this directly, but um, they have effects through what we eat. And then this is a little bit of a general interact more with the outdoors. If they're not outside more, they tend to touch things more um, and just physically interact with the outdoors. So air pollutants and asthma. Uh, in medicine, we like to say, where's the evidence? And so this is an old study, but I think it's so uh, concise that it's really 
shows how important this is. So during the Olympics in Atlanta in 1996, there was a uh, restriction in traffic patterns because of all of the traffic associated with the games. And this resulted in decreased traffic of over 20%. And ozone levels, as they were measured, also dropped by about 28%. So the, what the study showed is that emergency room visits for children um, for asthma decreased almost uh, by 50%. And we want to say, okay, causality, correlation, we talk about that with COVID a lot too, um, but they did find that actually children's emergency room visits for um, all other causes that they looked for were not uh, increased during this period. So that suggests that this finding is um, more of related than just associated with the drop in ozone. Climate change affects all children. So this is a, a look at the world and we are part of a global uh, society at this point. And it's estimated that because of some of these factors I mentioned that um, almost 90% of the global burden of disease due to climate change is affecting children under the age of five. And that's because um, everything I said about them breathing more and eating more is even truer per pound for little babies and, and younger children. Um, so the extrapolating from this, I know we all know this, but climate change affects West Virginia's children. And we have specific data for this. So we are already seeing over the last couple decades more days of severe heat, so very high temperatures. We're also seeing a lengthened pollen and allergy season um, and a longer tick season, which I think has actually been pretty dramatic. We also have been seeing, of course, worsening severe flooding events in particular. This is my middle daughter, Ellie. She's uh, one in this picture. And she, that year, I think was in the PICU a couple of times uh, and had several admissions for asthma flares. So this is also something that is a personal for me. Um, but for West Virginia, uh, we have the statistics. So the CDC has found that uh, the lifetime incidence of West Virginia, of asthma in West Virginia children is 14%, which is actually higher than the national average, despite the fact that we don't have major urban centers. Um, the hotter days and the longer pollen seasons have uh, led to, um, as well as the direct air pollutants, have led to a worsening asthma disease burden for the state as well. So children are, have more frequent asthma attacks and more severe asthma attacks. Uh, this is my, my friend, the deer tick here. So one of the other consequences that I think is very tangible is that we have now a longer tick and mosquito season. Now, mosquito-borne um, dis diseases like encephalitis are relatively rare, so it's hard to get a trend from them, but tick-borne disease has absolutely increased here in the mountain state. So if you look at this, um, it's been almost a 20-fold increase since the year 2000, and this is directly related, we think, to the, the length of the tick season. So increased flooding and drought. I wanna to speak to this point briefly. So I think um, this really hit home with me when I was uh, read this. In the last decade, we have declared, West Virginia has declared an emergency declaration for a flood uh, nearly every single year. So we all remember the flood of 2016, which did actually um, result in the death of uh, at least two children. Um, and then we also had another, a pretty major flood just a year ago. And then this was actually this year. So this is June of 2021. Um, so we've already hit our emergency declaration for flooding this year. So just in conclusion, um, uh, I, I th think that the evidence is very clear that um, pollutants and the effects of these pollutants is uh, worsening the health of West Virginia children in a very direct way, um, as well as adults and all of us who interact with the outdoors. Thank you for that, Dr. Waldeck. It's eye-opening and, you know, has me thinking about our, our kids on the front lines of the climate crisis in a different way. Wow. Um, so keep put, putting your questions in the chat because we are coming to our final speaker and then we'll be pivoting to the question and answer session. Um, but next, we are very glad to have as our guest, Colin O'Mara, and he's joining us to give us the latest, greatest breakdown from the current policy landscape in D.C., where I know he spends a lot of time, and what it means for West Virginia, which I know he spends a lot of time thinking about it, because we talk about it quite a bit. 
Um, Colin serves as president and CEO of the National Wildlife Federation, America's largest wildlife conservation organization with 53 state and territorial affiliates and nearly 6 million members. Under Colin's leadership, the National Wildlife Federation is focused on recovering America's wildlife, improving management of and access to public lands, restoring America's water bodies, and advancing environmental education and connecting every American child with the great outdoors, the outdoors that we wanna keep healthy, clean air, clean water to enjoy. He is regularly called, and I've been noticing this especially lately, before Congress to testify about wildlife, water, and climate issues. So we're very fortunate to have him with us tonight to give us the inside view and his, his insights and perspective in, in West Virginia's role in unsolving the climate crisis. So Colin, welcome to this West Virginia crowd. Glad to have you. Great, it is fantastic to be with you, Angie. And uh, just a huge thank you to the, the West Virginia Climate Alliance and um, Angie, just ama amazing job moderating. Um, I'm just honored to be with the, the panelists and my good friend, Jeremy and others that I've, I've, I've met along the journey. Um, Look, we're in a moment in time right now where the next 30, you know, 37 days are likely going to decide the level of investment that's going to be driven in our country for the next decade. Um, the stakes are incredibly high. And yeah, I think after, I'd argue, 70 years of broken promises um, to Appalachia, to West Virginia specifically, um, this is the first time where you know, I think there's a concerted effort to try to do right by folks that have powered this country for, you know, for a century. Um, and I think there's an opportunity, um, but the only way to, to have the level of investment to address the, the health impacts that, that we just heard about, um, the, the dislocated worker challenges that have been laid out, the inequities, the racial inequities um, that, that persist in so many ways is to go big. And you know, I, I, spent, I, I'm like, I look a little haggard right now because I was up until like, you know, maybe three or four in the morning last night um, trying to wrangle the last few Democratic votes um, to take the next step in the, the second package, the, the reconciliation package, um, to make sure that that uh, had a, a successful vote today, which it did, to allow the kind of the process to unfold. Um, so let me step back a little bit and just kind of talk about how I see the landscape and the opportunities for you all and why I, I'm hoping that you'll all be willing to, to lean in over these next 37 to 40 days. Um, you know, there are, there are two big packages before the, before the Congress right now. The first is the bipartisan infrastructure package. Um, it was originally the bipartisan infrastructure framework and this horrible acronym BIF, um, which sounded like a character from, you know, from back to the future. Um, and it was, it, it basically was, was really led and shaped in many ways by, by Senator Manchin. Um, I think if you look at the priorities in that bill, um, you'll see a lot of things that he's talked about for a long time, um, expanding rural broadband, making sure that the you know, 250,000 folks in West Virginia that don't have access to uh, the internet right now um, have that ability to, to access it with high, high speed fiber um, and making sure we're upgrading uh, internet access for another half million folks in West Virginia that you know, have access but either can't afford it or it's just low quality because um, you know, folks are running on dial up or, or you know, older phone lines. Um, so a big, big opportunity there. There's about five hundred uh, million dollars of wa of water upgrades. This is something that your that Senator Capito worked really hard on with my my senior senator Tom Carper here in Delaware, another West Virginian, um, who's born and born there. And um, uh, they worked together to make sure there's a lot of money in the bill, um, fifty five billion dollars total for for water uh, water infrastructure upgrades, including lead pipe pipe, pipe replacement and the like. So significant um, investments, so opportunities for West Virginia. And I can go through the list for transportation. Um, you know, there's about I think 74 million dollars for charging stations in the bill for West Virginia. Um, you know, huge investments in in things like um, industrial, like carbon capture technologies for you know, steel and cement and kind of advanced manufacturing facilities. Um, so some really really big pieces. And the challenge is that if you add it all up, it's still not nearly enough. And there are, there are some really important investments for West Virginia specifically. Um, for, for example, one of the most important ones is the $11.5 billion that Senator Manchin secured for uh, cleaning up abandoned mines, abandoned coal mines, $11.5 billion. It's a massive increase. It also has a reauthorization of the, of the uh, abandoned mine lands program as part of the bill after negotiating uh, an agreement with his Republican colleague, John Barrasso from Wyoming. Um, but these are big investments that are going to create you know, tens of thousands of jobs 
Um, and at the same time, they're not nearly enough given the moment that we're in. And I appreciated that, that in the in the both the health presentation, um, as well as as well as uh, as well as, as Pam's presentation, I'm kind of looking at the kind of the natural disasters that West Virginia's face. Because I think one area that has been underreported in the, both the bipartisan package as well as the reconciliation package um, are the level of investments that are there for resilience. And again, we need a lot more. But I had an old mentor that used to say, you know, you know flooding is natural. You know, disasters are man-made. Now we're making now, now, now that was maybe 15 years ago. I think now you know we've we've contributed to our level of disasters. But a lot of the a lot of the, a lot of the reasons we see the level of devastation that we're seeing is that we we haven't taken care of our riparian corridors, our wetlands, um, our our forests, places that could absorb a lot of the water, reduce the velocity and the volume, um, and and hopefully reduce some of the the damage that we're seeing and some of the, the deaths that we're seeing as a result of these catastrophic flash floods. So that's all in the first package. That's all in the bipartisan package. The second package that um, is being debated right now, and this is kind of what you see on the news um, kind of today, is what they call the reconciliation package. And this is the Build Back Better agenda that President Biden ran on. And in, within this package, there's you know, between 800, uh, 800 billion and a trillion dollars worth of spending in the climate space. It depends on how you define a couple of different, different pieces of the puzzle. Um, but this is where the big emission reductions are in the package. And so massive investments in clean energy tax credits, you know, four to $500 billion worth of uh, clean energy tax cuts over the next um, over the next ten years, really trying to provide predictability, lower cost, make sure we're leveling the playing field um, as we try to meet the the president's goal of getting to one hundred percent clean energy um, by by twenty thirty five. Um, one of the mechanisms in this legislation that's critical is the clean energy standard, and I'm sure many of you heard about it. Now it's being called either the clean energy incentive program or the clean energy payment program. Um, there's kind of different names running around. But the idea is that you would have standards um, for utilities to reduce their emissions from their, um, from their current portfolio using all the incentives that I just mentioned, um, as well as some other ones that I'll talk about in just a moment, and using those as a way to um, really drive down their, their emissions, um, have cleaner sources of energy, um, and then be rewarded for that. If they achieve the, the, the reductions, um, they receive a, a big incentives. Um, and if they, if they don't, there may be penalties in some of the out years. Here's the interesting thing for West Virginia um, is that just through that one program, not even looking at some of the other incentives, um, energy bills would actually go down. Um, and, you know, there's been some great analysis that I know many of you have been involved in um, looking at, you know, how the status quo is actually pretty expensive. You know, it's, it's, so it's $800 million you know, a year cheaper to move towards cleaner sources of energy in West Virginia than, than staying kind of with the status quo. Um, this policy on top of that would also make it cheaper because you'd be incentivized to try to have cleaner sources of energy. The reason that's significant is that, you know, we've always been trying to make the case saying, you know, cleaner, clean energy is better for climate, for public health, you know, for, for wildlife and making the case. It's also better for people's pocketbooks. And so when you look at the way President Biden approached this, this, this plan by making big investments in, in, infa in, in transmission infrastructure, combined with big incentives for the deployment of clean energy, combined with additional incentives for utilities to adopt cleaner sources of energy, you put that all together and the real beneficiaries are that are the ratepayers. Um, you know, I'm mean, having folks bills go down from this transition while you're creating a whole bunch of jobs, um, local construction jobs, in-state good union jobs, in-state um, is, a, is, a, is a game changer. And frankly, it's a slightly different approach. And then there's another piece kind of to complement that massive investment in clean energy. And it's these, a series of advanced manufacturing tax credits that Senator Manchin has been leading on. Um, it's, it's called 48C is the section of the tax codes. You might hear that as shorthand, shorthand occasionally. But the idea is that but you basically incentivize American companies to manufacture clean energy technologies, other advanced materials in the U.S. Um, in ways that are creating more local jobs, paying good wages, having you know, good union benefits, good union wages as part of that, and then having companies have an even greater incentive if they're willing to invest in communities like in Appalachia, like in, like in West Virginia, where there's been high rates of unemployment. And so you get yet another benefit on top of it. The reason I want to kind of lay out all these pieces, and, and there's other, there's big investments, 30 to $40 billion investments in, for, in forestry, which would make, make a huge difference for the Monongahela. It would complement the work that Senator Manchin did last year in the Great American Outdoors Act that provides some of the recreational infrastructure. Now this would provide some of the more restoration work um, for some of the areas that have had um, damage and just different uh, areas that have to be reforested and, 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 and having habitat restored. Um, there's a ton of, of, of opportunities for West Virginia jobs. And if you put it all together, I mean, you're talking, you know, hundreds of thousands of jobs over the next 10 years, lower energy bills, a more diversified economy, 
hopefully more folks that are, are coming into the States, more opportunities for folks that go to amazing, you know, go to West, go to Morgantown or go to Marshall and the amazing universities you have to stay, um, to stay close to home. And that fiber optics obviously create opportunities for folks to live in the uh, wild and wonderful land of West Virginia um, and, you know, and even you know, telecommute to other, other places. Um, so it creates a, a huge number of opportunities. And when you put it all together, it's not simply a climate plan. It's really an opportunity to, to diversify and strengthen the overall West Virginia economy. And frankly, do, for, do, do it now um, what so many of the other areas of the country have been able to do through federal investment in the past. I mean, you know, you think about places like North Carolina, the federal investment that led to the, the research triangle. You think about the investment that was made in the auto industry in the beginning, beginning of the Obama administration, allowing those industries to modernize and, and diversify and move to more, you know, cleaner products and electric vehicles and the like. You think about the number of times like Wall Street's been bailed out or you know, places that have been ravaged by, by different types of disaster. That kind of cavalry has never really come for West Virginia. And look, I'm, I'm from upstate New York. I'm, I grew up in Syracuse. Um, it never came for us either. I mean, we were promised the world um, during, during, the, during the kind of rush of globalization in the 80s and 90s, when a whole bunch of my friends ended up leaving the state to look for their parents to look for work. Um, as a lot of those plants were closing, you know, the help never came. We were promised the world, but you know, the cavalry never showed up. This is that opportunity to kind of correct all the issues that we're talking about right now. Um, but it really is predicated on going big. And now in the reconciliation package, there's also other parts around child tax care, child tax credits, um, opportunities for paid family leave, uh, child care credits. I mean, there's, there's a whole nother kind of set that I'm happy to talk about during the Q&A if there's interest. Um, but for this conversation, the climate pieces are transformative. And when you put together kind of the industrial and kind of heavy kind of fossil um, emission reduction investments in the first package with the clean energy and the, and the advanced transportation investments in the second package, if you put it together, um, the opportunity for West Virginia to go from kind of a, a laggard to a leader um, is there. And, it's, it, and it could truly be, be transformational. Now, look, I know there's been challenges with, you know, kind of the, the local politics and the challenges and, you know, with different types of technology and the like. I mean, one of my goals has been from the beginning to kind of create these opportunities that make it a win-win. I mean, I want to see more capital flowing into the places that have higher rates of air pollution, higher rates of, of carbon emissions, higher rates of unemployment um, as a way to direct capital flows into your community. Shannon and others from my team as I'm working with Angie and others, and many of you, trying to figure out ways to set these policies in a way that create those kind of opportunities for, for win-wins. Because um, frankly, I mean, having more clean energy um, in the state of West Virginia has a better impact on the overall national numbers than yet another you know, solar system in California and New York. You know, right now, you know, emissions may be you know, 1,800 pounds per megawatt hour in the state of West Virginia for the average megawatt hour of power. You know, in New York, you're like four or 500 megawatt hours. So you know, displacing some of that, ener that, that current pollution with cleaner sources um, truly is, is a huge impact on the mass balance. Doing it in a way that creates jobs and lowers bills is even better. And so I see huge opportunities that are very specific to West Virginia in particular um, to try to address some of these longstanding economic challenges in ways that also meet our, our public health and environmental goals. Before I wrap up, and I know we're going to get to the Q&A in just a second, um, there's also a, a lot of investments around environmental justice in the package. Cleaning up Superfund sites, cleaning up brownfields, um, some of this is in the first package, some of it's in the second package, um, but a way to address a lot of the, the toxic you know, pollution, the legacy pollution um, that unfortunately does so affect so many, so many of us um, in, in, real, in real ways. And I see the opportunity through, through this the kind, of, a, a kind of intersectional, you know, multi kind of, kind of big coalition, um, kind of pushing for these kind of investments to really be a way to, to inspire the, the youth. Um, to kind of work on a lot of these projects, hopefully through some kind of civilian conservation corps, civilian climate core 2.0, which is very much in play, probably a 10 to $30 billion investments coming in that area. But to really address the, the, those lingering health issues that are still there, whether it's PFAS or heavy metals, or it's um, you know, other types of, other types of, of legacy pollution, um, to in a way that really creates new opportunities for revitalization, for outdoor recreation, for tourism, for you know, new industries, I mean, it's a way to, again, diversify the overall economy. And so I'm really bullish um, on this overall package. I mean, I'm, I'm a little biased because I, I worked with the Biden administration from the campaign on kind of helping design a lot of elements. I want you all to know, though, how engaged Senator Manchin has been in every element of this. You know, I mean, like, it's not an accident that West Virginia is going to get a bigger share of the bipartisan package than probably any other state, uh, definitely per capita. Um, because of the way that he ran his processes for the in, for the natural for the natural resources committee, the energy and natural resources committee that he's the chair of, um, I, had the, I had the opportunity to testify before trying to make a couple tweaks and 
you know, make things even better. And he was able to, to take a lot of those recommendations, um, but he's doing the work. And at the same time, there's some things that he's skeptical. of. Um, there's some things that we need to convince him. Um, some of the investments around clean energy, making sure that he's convinced that they're going to benefit um, West Virginians, not just in the form of cleaner energy, but actually jobs um, and not just construction jobs and manufacturing jobs and you know, maybe even some upstream jobs. Um, you know, there are some real conversations to have around critical minerals um, and how we do that in a safe and smart way. Um, I, and frankly, I'd rather be um, fine figuring out ways to excavate some of those minerals and materials here safely. Um, again, in safe, in the right places, not, not destroying kind of the most spectacular places like is often proposed in places like the Boundary Waters or the Grand Canyon or Bristol Bay. Um, but again, like thinking about how we use innovation that's coming out of your amazing universities and then having that um, be applied to having that be applied to creating jobs locally to create bigger, better supply chains and really kind of thinking through all those jobs along the way um, to really supplement the work that Jeremy was talking about where we can help make sure the workers get the support they need, but hopefully moving them and their families into great opportunities for, for, future, for future prosperity. So I'm incredibly excited. The only thing I'm, I'm a little annoyed about is I was really excited about having this event in person because um, I was going to load up the uh, load up my little car and load up the family. I got, I got two young girls. I got a nine-year-old and a four-year-old who love Canaan. And my youngest is finally ready for Seneca Rocks. Like she was going to kind of thumb somewhere to the top because I, uh, I couldn't, I, I just couldn't carry her last time. It just became too painful on the way down. Um, but I love this coalition. I love what you're all doing with the, the climate work in the state. I'm a huge fan of the Reimagine Appalachia Coalition, which so many of you are a part of. Um, now's the moment. And I know folks are busy because you know, summer vacations are ending. You know, some have kids that are going back to school. The next month is critical. And so we're going to get to the call to action in just a second. But just from, from me, I just I really am begging you all to lean in. Like now is the time to make the case thing. This isn't just good for the country. It isn't just good for the world. It isn't just good for the planet, right? It's good for West Virginia. And it's good for West Virginia, Virginia on the economics, on the jobs, on the, on the costs. It's great for setting up you know, the next generation of real opportunity. And of course, it's huge on the environmental and the climate side. But you know, this is one of those true like win-win wins. Um, we wouldn't be in this position if it wasn't for all of your work over so many years. I mean, I, I, my Senator Manchin's a you know, good friend. I mean, I joke with how far we've come since that ad when he was you know, shooting the cap and trade bill during that one election. Um, you know, he's stepping up in some big ways, but we also have to have his back and we have to push. Um, we have to encourage him to, to show there's broad support in state for a lot of these actions. Um, you know, one of my favorite quotes from Franklin Delano Roosevelt was he said in his 1936 acceptance speech, he said, he goes, I agree with you. I think that that's what we should do. Now make me do it. Um, and what he meant was, you know, build the public support to give, you know, I don't want to say cover, but to give the, uh, the support to, uh, to make sure the legislative action actually occurred. And, you know, that's pretty good advice from a person that probably moved more federal legislation than any other president in our history. Um, I think that's the moment right now. And, you know, like I said, we have a, we have a clock. We have a 37 day clock to, uh, to change the world, uh, to change the country and hopefully set up West Virginia in a way that makes those, you know, your amazing country roads, the, uh, the, the, not just the, uh, the epicenter of the energy in economy in this country, but really a model of what a diversified kind of natural resource friendly economy could look like. Um, that's a pretty big aspiration, but it's definitely doable. You have all the pieces, the policy pieces are there. We got a lot of work to get there. So with that, let me turn it back over to Angie. And I look forward to the Q and A. All right, all right. Did y'all hear that? This is the time to change the world. We got 37 days. <laughs> And our Senator Manchin is key to this. So as we, you all are putting your questions into the chat, we're going to um, hope that you're feeling motivated and inspired to actually take action in this moment. And we're gonna share a way to do that really easily now. Um, let's see. So if you're seeing on the screen, a way to, you can take action. Now we've tried to make it really easy for you. You can text WB Climate on your smartphone, text that to 72572. That will generate a link on your phone to um, an action page that in 90 seconds or less. So as we're talking here, we hope that we'll do this right now. Um, to send a message to Senator Manchin. We've given you some, some uh, suggested talking points that really hope that you will personalize the message based on what you're hearing tonight, what you hope to happen, some things I wrote down that are so important in this moment is, is to make sure that West Virginia gets its fair share. We have an incredible opportunity. We don't wanna miss the boat, Senator Manchin. We wanna go big and he needs and wants to hear from West Virginians and needs to hear from all of us. So 
please take the time if someone could put in the chat this this link too because if you uh, don't want to do the text vehicle you can also use this web link that'll get you to the landing page and can take that action now. So hopefully I've talked long enough. So you've done that. Let us know if you've done it. Tell us if you're taking an action in the chat. And, and I think it'll also give you options to share this with friends that care on social media, uh, because now, it, now is the time to be a laggard, not a leader. I like that, Colin. <laughs> we can do this. All right. So, all right, Gail. Thanks, Gail. Gail's got it done. All right, we are going to get our panelists lined up to field some Q&A in the next 15 minutes. And I think we'll start with um, one of our general questions. Let's see, where'd that go? There we go. Uh, you know, as we're talking about Senator Manchin and thinking of, of his key role on, on, on brokering these deals, and, and, and we know that he um, talks a lot and, and acts accordingly to, to benefit West Virginia in, in the way, and, and use his leadership to do so, um, one of the questions we got in was, what can we all do to make sure that Senator Manchin goes big on climate by supporting all of the climate policies in the budget reconciliation bill. So Colin, you touched on any of, on that. Was, is there anything else you would say? And then we'll, we'll go to the others to see what they have to add. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, Senator Manchin, is an, he's an old school politician, right? He wants to hear from all of you. Um, he doesn't want to hear from a bunch of suits in DC. Um, he wants to hear for you know, what you're excited about, what you're concerned about, um, what opportunities that you see. Um, you know, he's somebody that believes in fairness. Um, I think he feels that, you know, West Virginia hasn't gotten its fair share of a lot of uh, efforts over the years, uh, all the different bailouts. And, you know, you think about the $27 trillion in, in debt that we have right now, very little of that wound up in West Virginia um, you know, over, the, over the years, the tax cuts, the wars, the, you know, either, either bailouts. And so, you know, I think, I think using language that's um, familiar um, and just being kind of honest with them about like, we need this, right? I mean, we, we got to put a lot of folks to work. Um, we got to kind of remake the state and we're never going to have more seniority than you have right now. I mean, like, I mean, his power in this moment, is, is, this is the sacrilegious in West Virginia to say, he has more power in this moment than, than Senator Byrd had in terms of the amount of money they're spending. And Senator Byrd's like a legend, right? I mean, like the amount of money, I can't, you can't drive five minutes without seeing a Byrd something in, in West Virginia. Um, and so I think that's, that's one piece. Um, he is concerned about the cost. And I, and I think I, I meant to mention this in my remarks. I know Angie, you meant, you meant for me too. Um, uh, I mean, I think, you know, a lot of the pay fors that folks are talking about, like higher taxes on folks making more than four hundred thousand dollars, having the corporate rate go up a couple percentage points. Um, you know, some of the closing, some of the loopholes, doing more enforcement of you know folks that aren't are avoiding taxes right now. None of that affects most folks in West Virginia. I mean, like if you were trying to design a set of policies to not have taxes go up in West Virginia, you'd basically have the Biden plan. And so I think you know there's a difference between saying you're going to spend you know. $3 trillion, $3.5 trillion, that'd be all deficit finance. That's not what the president's proposing. He's proposing every single dollar be paid for. Um, and so if that's the case, that, that should meet the fiscal responsibility test that the, that the senators kind of proposed. And so you know, it's not just a smart thing to do in terms of investments that have a huge return. It's fiscally responsible to pay for it. Um, and that's different, right? This isn't the normal like Democrat, you know, kind of just spending and spending or Republicans cutting taxes and not having anything come, at, come in afterwards. This is a different, it's a different model. I think those are two points, the, the benefit that you're seeing in West Virginia. And then the second thing is the, uh, the, that it is fiscally responsible to make investments that have huge returns that are also paid for. Thanks. Other panelists want to weigh in on, on um, the message to Senator Ter Manchin? And, and... Yeah, I, this is Sean. I, I would like to point out just one thing. And I, I, I have to say, I really support everything that Colin just said. Um, but I think it's also important for us to point out to Senator Manchin, who is an immense champion uh, of new technologies in fossil fuels, particularly carbon capture and blue hydrogen. Um, and unfortunately, those technologies are being sold to the public as yet again, another way to perhaps save coal and save natural gas and their roles particularly in the electric generating system. 
And frankly, those are not even, never mind their environmental impacts, which are problematic at best and perhaps catastrophic at worst. The fact is that those technologies are not economically viable. Because right now we're in a situation where in the um, energy sector, already renewable resources are have long since undercut coal and cost and are now undercutting natural gas. When you take those technologies and you add on the incremental cost of technologies like CCS, they become even less economically viable, even though you may mitigate some substantial portion of their um, greenhouse gas emissions. And the other thing that I think we need to just keep reminding Senator Manchin of is that the petrochemical industry, um, the shale industry, the natural gas industry have not been and are not going to make significant economic contributions to the communities where that activity takes place. We've seen that for a decade at, at Orvi, we've documented it. Um, we've gone through the numbers provided by the federal government on issues like employment and income. And we know the structural reasons for the failure. And so it is again misleading to talk about technologies like CCS and like blue hydrogen as though they're in any way going to be economic saviors for the region. And I know that's not what Senator Manchin wants to hear, frankly. He wants to innovate, not eliminate, I think is one of his favorite phrases. But that kind of innovate, there is innovation that will indeed stimulate job growth and prosperity in West Virginia, but it's not that innovation. And it's a message that needs he needs to hear. Jeremy, would you add something from your perspective and your body of work? Yeah, I don't. I don't think I have a. Uh, a I'm not the the Joe Manchin whisperer here. I think that's more in Collins' purview. So I don't think I have any insights to add there. I just, I really think that what I was, what I was thinking about what was going through my brain while Sean was talking. There are several things, but one is just that we have to think about the broader economy. Most people who are in the energy industry right now who are facing job loss are not going to stay in the energy industry when they lose their jobs. And that's just the reality. Of it. If you if you are the guy that shovels coal into the boiler at the coal plant, you can do other jobs you know, maybe cleaning up, doing the reclamation at that site and so forth. But a lot of those people won't have skills that are immediately transferable to something else. So I guess my point is, I was answering this in the chat earlier, it really, we need to think about it in a broader perspective. How do we diversify our economies? How do we think about the manufacturing potential for clean energy in West Virginia? Um, because you know, we have all this rail infrastructure. Why can't we build a factory that makes wind turbines that get sent out to the Midwest, for example? Um, you know, what about the outdoor economy? What about, there's just all these other things that have to be brought into the mix when you start to think about what a transition, a fair transition looks like. Yeah, Kate and Pam, I wanna ask you about this question. We got kind of to the cost of doing nothing. The the questioner asked about it, any studies. I, I don't know of any West Virginia studies yet that identify the cost of doing nothing about climate, but what comes to mind to you in terms of if we, if we do nothing, <laughs> if we don't act on climate now, what, what kind of costs social health otherwise are we talking about? Pam, what, what do you think? Well, since I have sort of a you know, background in, in medicine, <laughs> medical background. Uh, I always thought that if, if we do nothing, the, the cumulative impacts will in, increase. Uh, it will affect the health of the people here in, in West Virginia, uh, not just here in Kanawha County, but all across the state because, um, but because we have poor water quality. We need better water quality. We need better air quality to, to help the people become able to work. I mean, the workers are our are, are best, you know, um, commodity here in West Virginia. And so if we if we do nothing, it's it's gonna deter their health. It's also going to continue, uh, we, we will 
still be the last on the to the last thing when it comes to economic growth. Uh, I agree that we need uh, more diverse jobs. With if with more diverse jobs, we'll bring in more population because we we've, we've lost so much of our population. I mean, we even lost the Senate seat now as a result of the loss in population. Um, so just to um, to bring more population in to to show the world about our, our our natural beauty that's here in West Virginia. I had relatives in this weekend, and that's what they wanted to see. So you know, we we went out. We we were outside. We we went to Fayette County. We toured the sites in Fayette County. They love the outdoors. So uh, we just need to let people know that West Virginia is a beauty, and uh, and we just need a, a broader base and diverse jobs here so that people will have a, a life to come and, and live here. Yeah, you're here. Kate, what, what comes to mind when you think of doing nothing? What do we have to lose there? Yeah, I mean, the, the potential health impacts are, are really significant. And I think something that, um, and again, I speak as a, as a pediatrician and a pediatric critical care doctor, but I think something that people don't think about is um, things like a severe asthma attack uh, require an intensive care unit for children. Um, it's children are just more specialized and the level of care that you can get on an adult floor is different. And um, uh, ICUs are few and far between and we are a, a rural access state. And so access to care is significant um, and the delay that that takes. And asthma is a disease um, in particular that delays in care can be life-threatening. Um, and, and we are seeing uh, I mean, any any kind of uh, asthma trigger can cause asphyxial asthma. So asthma it does have a mortality rate, um, but of course, I think the bigger picture is that um, we want our children to be healthy and to grow, and we don't want them to have limitations to their activity because they can't breathe. Um, we don't want them to uh, be hospitalized for any reason. And from a kind of bigger picture, it's expensive um, and, and every dollar that we have to direct for um, high level care or even just chronic outpatient visits for these diseases that we know are, um, are increasing and worsening um, is money that we, we have lots of other things that we wanna put that towards um, rather than just being sick. So I think the cost, and we know the cost is very high. Um, the, the question for me as an activist or the motivation for me is to figure out how to get um, the people that can affect change to think about, um, you know, delayed gratification, basically. Yeah, I, I would like to kick in also that there are real economic costs that West Virginia is suffering from right now for its failure so far to embrace clean energy transition. Um, right now, somewhere in the neighborhood of a third of all Fortune 500 companies basically cannot locate an operation in West Virginia, even if they were inclined to, because many of them have sustainability goals. And in a state that gets 92% of its electricity from coal, you cannot meet your corporate sustainability goals with anything located in West Virginia. We know, for instance, in southeastern Ohio, they lost a major Amazon processing center there for precisely that reason. The grid in the region could not provide a clean enough um, power resource for them. And even the West Virginia Department of Commerce has noticed noted that this is a problem um, in their efforts to try to recruit companies to come to the state. And then also building off, you know, what was just said about the Pam's points about health impacts. You know, when companies look to relocate, they care a lot about quality of life. And there are a number of economists, including Heather Stevens at WVU, um, Amanda Weinstein at the University of Akron, who have looked at the correlation between quality of life considerations and economic growth. And they've found that those considerations, quality of life factors, are even more powerful as determinants of economic growth than business environment things like reduced business taxes or relaxed regulations. In other words, the, most, the best thing that you can do as a state legislator or a county commissioner, if you want to uh, generate economic growth, is to do, adopt measures that improve quality of life rather 
than cutting business taxes or relaxing regulation. Well, and that leads to, to a question we have um, directed for Colin is thinking about, or if you have suggestions or can kind of forecast ahead, well, what, what should we think, be thinking at the state policy level? You know, what suggestions for state policy in West Virginia um, should we be thinking about that would work together with the federal policy to benefit particularly our coal communities? Okay. And I don't wanna get ahead of ourselves because like, we really need all advocacy focused on getting the federal money. Um, but then there's going to be, you know, a, another level of advocacy fights about how the money is spent. Um, and obviously, there's a ton of state level policies. And obviously, there's been a lot of back and forth over the years about water quality standards. And, and you know, and obviously, you know, PFAS more, than more, more recently and kind of some of the horrible chemical spills in Charleston and other places. Um, and, I mean, but I do think that, you know, this health narrative, and I think Sean's exactly right. And Ms. Pam is, is, is as well. And, and Dr. Waldeck, I mean, I think, you know, the places that are going to win the talent of the future are places where folks want to live especially if you can work remotely. And so you're better, especially if you have like this good broadband, right? I mean, like you could see a whole bunch of folks. And again, I'm not proposing a whole bunch of like, you know, folks from all the cities coming out to West Virginia because <laughs> I'm not sure you want them all. But the, there's an opportunity, right, to have, you know, West Virginia being a location of choice. But we're going to have to, you know, clean some things up, right? I mean, like folks aren't going to want to, you know, have, you know, waterways that are, are contaminated. They're not going to have concerns about being too close to Superfund sites or, you know, old coal ash piles that, that could leach in. I mean, so this is where like that, the big investment in combination of Superfund and Reclamation makes sense. I mean, the picture behind me, um, it's because I didn't want to show you my, you know, kind of hostage wall I have behind me normally, um, is, uh, is Blackwater, right? And so this is my, my little, my little three-year-old fell in last time, fell over the thing. Um, you know, folks don't know about the difference between the tannins versus, you know, kind of pollution, but it's a whole different issue for East Coast folks. But I mean, I think there's, there's something about having, you know, the entire, you know, kind of community rally around making Herring West Virginia the healthiest, best place to live, and then the jobs following, as opposed to, as Sean said, the strategy a lot of folks do, where it's all, you know, proposed to be taxed and regulation. And look, and if that was the case, Alabama and, and, and Mississippi would be, you know, killing everybody right now when it comes to the economy, and they're not. So it's clearly these other X factors, and West Virginia has got more amazing stuff to see than almost anyone else within a, you know, 500-mile radius. Well, I think we have one question for one more Time for one more question, but Pam, I want to flag for you that that people are looking for concrete ways to increase participation of underrepresented and BIPOC members of our communities um, in discussions and decision making about addressing climate change. So I hope you can help us um, maybe come up with a with those specific recommendations we can share with everyone here after this, because we, we're running out, we've got three minutes left and that's a big question and an important one. Um, and, and the question uh, I think we're gonna end on is related to, you know, the idea of, I, the word used was longevity of jobs. And, you know, I think about durability, I think about sustainability, you know, I think about how we break out of this boom bust cycle that West Virginia has caught ourselves in. I mean, how, what are, what, what are like the essential components of, of policymaking of action that will ensure that we're not repeating that cycle, that we're, we're talking about sustainability, we're talking about a new economy that will be with us for generations to come. Um, let's see, Jeremy, I'll start with you. Well, I don't know if I have any, a magic bullet. I guess I would just say that um, the, the, the way that I say it in a pithy way is that the solutions have to be federally funded and locally driven. What works in, in McDowell County, West Virginia is not gonna work in Gillette County, Wyoming, is not gonna be the same as what it looks like in Centralia, Washington. It's, it, has to, it has to have the, the, the specifics of what the answer looks like has to be driven by that community. And they have to be supported in that effort. They can't just be left to figure it out themselves. They have to have you know, robust and sustained and durable policies. You can't just reinvent an economy in one federal budget cycle. You need decades of investment and, and sustained investment. So I think that's, that, that's how we answer in a general sense. Colin, do you think what Jeremy's saying is resonating in DC? How is it landing? 
I, I do. And I think, I think it's actually an evolution in a good way. I mean, I think a lot of the federal mandates of the past are, are moving towards, you know, trying to have, as Jeremy said, these kind of locally driven, but federally funded um, solutions. And so, um, but the key is having, you know, kind of having your act together, right? Because I mean, you know, other folks will that, you know, have a very different vision than the vision that's being, you know, kind of put, put together by all of you, they, they will mobilize quickly. Yeah, and look, and there's a lot of policies and I, I feel bad, I didn't mean to, you know, kind of make short of the other question, but you know, you have a lot of policies right now, the state level, the utility commission, the like that are skewed against, you know, cleaner sources of energy. I and mean, there's a lot of work to be done. It's just a lot easier to have that fight when there's money and there's investors coming, right? Because all of a sudden then it's not hypothetical, right? It's, it's very much a real, like, are we going to choose a cleaner future or not? And so like, I think in terms of durability, um, I view, I think, you know, anytime you look at econ economic transitions, I mean, that the first wave is basically trying to make folks whole, right? Like trying to figure out ways to, through investments, I mean, Jerry laid out the slide beautifully, but you know, a lot of that's public spending. So that could be infrastructure, that can be direct payments, that can be you know, other types of public works. But the idea is that you're going to basically invest in, you know, kind of near-term job creation through public investment to give the private sector and give private options the ability to take hold in the diversification. And this is why I think layering in some of the advanced transportation and some of the, the broadband solutions and together that gives you that foundation for future growth is going to be important, but you know, I mean, the future economy of, of West Virginia is, is likely going to be you know, innovations that are coming out of you know the universities, uh, Marshall and and WVU, you know, in, in that that are you know, hopefully advanced manufacturing is a big part of it. I'm sure there'll be some resource related pieces to it, um, and hopefully that's done in you know non non destructive ways. Tourism is going to be huge. We got to figure out a way to have those be family sustaining wages and not you know twelve bucks an hour guiding. Um, but I mean, it's going to be a more diversified, hopefully knowledge based economy. Um, with a whole lot of folks that are getting a great education and then choosing to stay because of the quality of life. That's right. That's right. So we are at our time. Boy, could we talk more about this, but really appreciate the panelists for your participation tonight. All of our attendees out there, I, uh, there's been a lot of um, information exchanged in the chat. Uh, be assured that there will be uh, a follow-up from this webinar. We will be sharing again resources that were shared in the chat. Um, we will be sharing a recording of this. Uh, we will follow up with you. There were so many people to thank. We can't thank now, we're out of time. We put this together and we'll be continuing this work like 37 days. We've got a big push to make. So again, let's put that link in the chat about how you can take action now, share that with your friends. Let's let Senator Manchin know that there are West Virginians who are um, very concerned about this issue and see this opportunity and are counting on him to, to lead on this. So we are going to wrap up with one more slide that will give you a link to get more involved with the West Virginia Climate Alliance. It details the different groups that were involved in planning of this event and how you can stay involved in all of those that, you know, how, how wonderful it was to see the interest and turnout uh, in tonight's event. We hope to stay connected in a series of conversations, town halls. We'll be talking as the Climate Alliance tomorrow about what's next and keep you posted on this. So thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Quentin, you're gonna put up that final slide and a little musical send off to enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you all. <laughs>